off. So please welcome Dr. Jan Wright to the stage. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to this group today. I have to say I really enjoyed last night. I've gone through quite a few number of those dinners and the fashion show and uh, the ambassadors thing and the great company around the table. So thank you very much. Uh, my head at the moment is full of water quality uh, because later this month I will be releasing a report on the science of water quality. And I hasten to say it's a report for the general reader, not for some of the experts present here. But as Nick suggested, and I was already planning to, I wanted to begin by explaining my role briefly. Um, like the Auditor General and the Ombudsman, I am what is known as an Officer of Parliament. That means that while I'm a public servant, I do not work for the government, but for Parliament as a whole. I'm not bound to follow the policies of any party. So that means that I am truly politically independent. In this role, I provide advice to MPs through investigations that result in written reports that are tabled in Parliament by the Speaker. Uh, the last report that I did uh, attracted a lot of publicity. It was around 1080. And the second main thing I do is uh, give advice to select committees uh, on bills and inquiries that are before them. And the last submission I made there was on the exclusive economic zone, which the minister referred to, the environmental management of the ocean. A report, or indeed a submission, will generally contain recommendations to specific ministers. And I aim to make those recommendations well-reasoned and pragmatic. I have no power beyond the ability to persuade, and it is up to the government of the day as to whether or not those recommendations are taken up. So that's a little introduction to my role. Um, th so the next report is going to be on the science of water quality. This one, unusually, will not have recommendations. Its aim is to increase understanding. And um, one of my functions is actually an educational one. As you well know, water quality is a complicated topic. I personally, came into this job knowing very little about it indeed. I had a background in quite a number of environmental areas, but water quality wasn't one of them. I became aware early on that water quality was a very crowded space. I did not want to cut across other things going on like the Land and Water Forum and just create confusion or indeed duplicate what anyone else was doing. So I thought, you know, what would be a useful thing to do? And one of the things that has uh, disturbed me greatly is the town country finger pointing. Um, also, lots of confusion, lots of inaccurate reporting. I quote from one newspaper editorial, they discovered high levels of bacteria in wells in the area, especially nitrate. And so that might seem a small thing, but uh, there are clearly a lot of things to be sorted out. So this report had its genesis some time ago. I talked to a large group of MPs across the House on the science of water quality, and I was, it was really interesting to see, as it were, how thirsty they were for that knowledge and understanding. When I finished speaking, there was a forest of hands up with questions. I mean a forest. I think every MP in the room had their hand up. Last year, I gave a talk on the history of water quality, looking at New Zealand's history through water quality eyes to a conference in Rotorua. And that's where this report starts, the report on the science of water quality, because we think of water quality as a new problem, but it's not. It is high profile. The nature of water quality problems has changed over the years, and it reflects very much the way we've used the land, our history, where we've come from. And this is really what I'm going to focus on mostly today is talking about the history of water quality because it does set a context, gives us perspective on today's environmental issues. You discover that there was rather a lot wrong with the good old days and I believe if you want to understand today you have to search yesterday. Um, so I think that it's, it's what I'm trying to do is give a, a contextual understanding and I hope that um, many of you will be interested in getting a copy of the report when it comes out. So really, the title of my talk today is a little misnamed. It's not so much about the science of water quality, but it's really about drawing on the early part of this forthcoming report on the science of water quality. 
So, the big three pollutants in water that we have to deal with, pathogens, bacteria and viruses, and so on, all sorts of other critters, uh, sediment, particles of soil and rock, and nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Obviously, there are some local issues with other water pollutants. I was intrigued recently to find out just how much arsenic the Wairaki power plant puts into the Waikato River. The difference between these three kinds of water pollutants is not straightforward. The Dominion Post recently has been reporting on a toxic blue-green algal bloom in the Hutt River and warning people about it. So, what's a blue-green algal bloom? Well, some blue-green algal blooms are brown, some of them are red, some of them are black, some of them are kind of bluish-green. So that's kind of confusing for a start. Blue-green algal blooms can occur when there's too much nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, uh, plants in the water being over-fertilised by N and P. But hang on a minute, blue-green algae are cyanobacteria. So they are bacteria and they make you, can make you very sick. So they must be pathogens, because pathogens are the ones that make you sick. But they are, but the cause of blue-green algal blooms is the same as for algae that are plants, and these cyanobacteria photosynthesize in a, a kind of photosynthesis like plants. So are they animals or plants? Is this a pathogen problem or a nutrient problem? Now, I hope I've utterly confused you because that was the purpose. That was the purpose that trying to unravel that sort of conundrum and break down the understanding is really the purpose of our report. So, Number one, pathogens. Number two, sediment. Number three, nutrients. The history of water quality uh, since Europeans came in this country is roughly a history of concern about each of those in order. First, the pathogens being of concern, then the sediment, and now the nutrients. But I want to start way back in our history. This country of ours was created by water. Over millennia, water and ice literally moved mountains and ground them down. And without water, which is a bit hard to imagine, of course, apparently the Southern Alps would be five times as high as Mount Cook. So that's, that's the power of water. For Maori, there is a very strong relationship with water. As uh, pr probably most people in this room are aware, part of the way in which Maori introduced themselves is to say, this is my mountain where I come from, and this is my river. For the Whanganui iwi, and I acknowledge George here today, sitting next to him last night, the, there is such a strong identification with their river that this is one of their sayings, ko o, ko, sorry, ko o te awa, ko te awa, ko o. That, that means I am the river and the river is me. It's a strong, strong identification. But for Europeans, it was different when they came. For them, rivers were frightening things. I have at home somewhere a newspaper account of one of my great-grandmothers on her 90th birthday, and one of the stories she relates is the terror of crossing the Clarence um, in North Canterbury. And in pioneering times, drowning was actually known as the New Zealand death. Okay, so moving along, I'm going through, moving on with history now from that point. This is a painting by Charles Heafy, the great, you know, we'll know about the Heafy track on the west coast. This is a pristine environment painted in 1840, the Wairau River in Northland, and rather amuses me because it looks like an Oxford versus Cambridge rowing race. But um, uh, this is, I, I actually rather like this, this picture. So I put this in, this is the kind of environment that the Europeans came from, very heavily clothed in vegetation, though less so in the dry east, of course. So Europeans began from that point to tame the land on an increasingly large scale, and of course we're still doing it. Changes to the land use meant changes to water quality. Pathogens, number one, was the first of the big three to become a problem. In 1860, we had a gold rush. Outbreaks of typhoid. One writer said it was so common in New Zealand it should be called colonial fever. In 1862, and the Otago Daily Times wrote this, Dunedin is allowed to remain a city that invites pestilence. 
Every sanitary precaution is neglected. Its streets and the surroundings of its houses reek with impurity and filth. Its inhabitants imbi imbibe poison in the water they drink. They didn't beat around the bush when they described something those days. They did like the colorful language. But th there was at one stage sewage washing into the grounds of parliament. Night soil in Auckland, the euphemism, we you know what that means, was actually dumped for a time above Western Springs, which then was not a racetrack, but actually a water supply for the city. So it was all pretty grim, really, and a lot of illness. And that didn't change until um, this started to happen, piped sewage. This is Dunedin in 1906. And as I was preparing this, I thought, actually, that's not so long ago. That's the year my father was born. Pathogens remain with us, but they are no longer murderous on the whole. Still work to be done with sewage and wastewater. Great to see increasing numbers of inland towns spraying effluent onto land, but I acknowledge that can be costly. Um, of course, uh, many farms are doing that too. Pathogens were recognized early on as a problem simply because people were dying and towns were clearly very unpleasant. So it did get dealt to had a high profile and could be dealt to. But number two was sediment. And the problem began very early on, but no one worried about it for a long time. But it starts again with the gold rush, a wave of gold miners rolling on from California to Australia and then to New Zealand. My great grandfather uh, was one of them, one of those gold miners, not the one married to the great grandmother who was terrified of the Clarence I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, here we go, sluicing for gold near Collingwood, on the top of the South Island. What better way to put sediment into rivers than to put high-pressure water on, onto the land? There was quite a bit of early legislation around this, but it was not about protecting water, but it was about rivers being legally declared to be sludge channels for the disposal, disposing of tailings. Legal declaration, this is no longer a river, this is a sludge channel. It's quite extraordinary to us to think about that today. Miners actually had greater use, greater rights over the use of rivers then than farmers had for using the water for irrigation. So, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, not so great in the good old days as we beat ourselves up today. Um, this picture is of another polluting industry early on, uh, a boat on the Manawatu taking flax out uh, flax was a polluting industry, though, on a much smaller scale, but there was a lot of rotting organic matter put into rivers from the flax industry. Um, this is the ship Dunedin, sailing out of Dunedin in 1882. The first shipment of refrigerated meat to Britain, and I learned last night, 3,000 lamb carcasses on board. Now, why is this so significant? This changed everything. Meat and butter and cheese were no longer just for local consumption. And so the need, the, the possibility of uh, farming on a much, much greater scale uh, suddenly became uh, a possibility. Um, I'm just going to quote from an account of the time because I thought this was rather fun. You can see I would have quite liked to have been a historian if I'd gone in a different direction in life. When the vessel became becalmed in the tropics, the crew noticed that the cold air in the hold was not circulating properly. To save his historic cargo, Captain Whitson crawled inside and sawed several extra air holes, almost freezing to death in the process. Crew members had to pull him out by a rope attached to his ankles and resuscitate him. Uh, presumably, they did that by pouring rather a lot of rum down his throat. So moving on to what this change meant, here we have settlers actually sowing grass seeds among the stumps. Um, didn't bother to clear them, and of course there was a lot of burning that went on. So the next stage was really the sheep boom. We need more pasture fast. Um, and of course, as I said before, just moving beyond felling forest to wild scale, loud scale burning. And that went on for a long, long time. Now, I was talking about uh, this early uh, use of pasture and clearing of forest to some friends of mine and one of them ran in and he said I've got a photograph which I think of this is New Zealand and he's given me permission to use this photograph because I think everybody in it is long dead anyway 
So this is 1909 near Levin. This is Aunt Ethel's wedding. And this is New Zealand. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it up there. Probably not that well. It's an old photograph. But in the, in the background, you've got burned forest. In the foreground, you've got grass. And so this is this transition. And I think the interesting thing is they were no doubt very proud of their achievements. And so they regarded a background of burnt forest as being scenic, I guess. Um, so it's, you can sort of see how it went on. The thinking went on. And so I think one of the things about water quality I like to think about is people did what they did at the time because they believed you know, it was the right thing to do. And um, I think we have to bear that in mind, uh, especially we're trying to get away from the finger pointing. Uh, matters. So um, moving on to um, this large number of sheep. Here's the freezing works near um, Hastings, I think it's Fokkatu in the 1920s. Soldiers returning from the First World War, of course, were given farms. Same thing happened after World War II, but a lesser extent. Um, and a lot of those farms, or the farms increasingly as the good land disappeared, became those steep hill farms. Uh, and after World War II, of course, um, top dressing with superphosphate on that hill country began um, creating work for uh, returning pilots, interestingly enough, I found out. So all of this, of course, this history of moving uh, the production to huge pasture and farming of animals is about sediment. Clearing the forest meant Roots don't hold the soil together. Heavy rain washes the soil away into creeks and rivers and takes the fertility with it. And most importantly, phosphorus, one of the two nutrients that we are so concerned about today, uh, comes in that sediment. And still today, the major source of phosphorus into rivers is uh, sediment, um, uh, both the legacy of it that's been bound up um, in, in, in lakes and to some extent in rivers and the erosion that still continues today as, as part of that clearance. Um, where concern started to happen is of course another effect of sediment which isn't really about water quality although it interacts of course and that's about floods. This is the Mohaka River in Hawke's Bay in 1938 and that had a big impact on people's thinking at the time. 38 people were killed in that dramatic flood. So the sediment problem is, of course, about more than water quality, and we still see that today um, in Golden Bay, for instance. Some of you will have been here. This is the Bridge to Nowhere in Whanganui River, one of the uh, tributaries of it. It's a lasting symbol of clearing too much land. Um, a lot of those hill country farms, the fertility fell away very fast as the soil washed in, and the farms were abandoned. And um, you may or may not remember that Dennis Glover's famous poem about magpies, you know, the Quadle Oodle uh, poem where Tom's hand was strong to the plough and Elizabeth's lips were red, and I can't remember any more. But basically, it's about a couple farming one of those um, hill country farms which they had to walk away from because of uh, what happened to it. So, erosion today. Here's our legacy from those years. It's a legacy from people who thought they were doing the right thing. It's still with us. So moving on to number three, and of course the uh, face of the nutrient problem really is uh, algae and other weeds that are out of control. This is Lake Waihola in Otago. It's where most attention is focused. But can I make the comment, you might be getting the impression by now that I think sediment is underplayed these days and you would be right. But here's the recipe for algae and the other unwanted plant growth that's driving so much of today's concern. Sunlight, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, the biggest source is urine from livestock, of course. Phosphorus, the biggest source, sediment from erosion. You need N and P to get these bad effects. So. Just now leaving that history alone and making a, a few comments about the science of water quality, what can science do? What can science do? Fundamentally, it can tell us about cause and effect. Without stand, understanding cause and effect, we are blind. And one more quick story from history, 1911, going back to those flax mills in the Manawatu, 
there was a out big outbreak of typhoid among workers in the flax mills. The cause was thought to be the brown, rancid water coming out of the mills. And in fact, the mill owners tried to get legislation passed at that time to protect themselves from prosecution. They didn't manage to do that. But the cause actually was sewage from the town of Fielding. So without an understanding cause and effect, we can do nothing. So specifically, we need science for measuring the different parameters of water quality, for understanding the causes of change in those parameters, designing interventions that are likely to be effective, and for measuring the effectiveness of those interventions. We need, however, to know when more science is not needed. A call for more science to be done can sometimes be a way of delaying making difficult decisions. There is, for example, no need for more scientific data or modelling to establish the link between the land use change that has taken place in the Waituna catchment in Southland and the dire state of the Waituna lagoon. There simply is no other explanation. And while science is necessary for policy and for good decision making, and I also think for a wide understanding of it for collaborative uh, efforts, as the Minister was speaking about, it is not sufficient. People who work in my office have learned not to say in front of me, the science says we did, should do such and such. Science doesn't tell us what to do. It describes what is and models what might be. It doesn't tell us how to make trade-offs, and trade-offs of some kind would almost certainly be needed. So uh, the report that I'll be releasing uh, on the science of water quality will be tabled in Parliament, God and others willing, on the 20th of March. Um, I hope it's useful. I know certainly that what this tr trust does is useful. You are the people in gumboots on the ground. In a way, I'm rather envious of you. And I know also I acknowledge that what seems straightforward in Wellington is seldom straightforward when dealing with the reality. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here today.